You are listening to the Visualising War podcast. In each episode, we talk about representations of war in art, text, film and music. With new guests each time, we look at how people have described or imagined war in different periods and places, and we discuss the impact which war stories have on us as individuals and societies. Hello, my name is Nicholas Vieta. And my name is Alice Koenig. And we co-direct the Visualising War project at the University of St Andrews. In this episode, we talk to our St Andrews colleague, Dr John Coulston, an expert on Roman military history and also an art historian who has spent much of his career studying one of the most famous pieces of war art to come out of the Roman Empire, Trajan's Column. The Emperor Trajan reigned from 98 to 117 AD. While many previous Roman emperors had based themselves in Rome and left military campaigning to their generals, Trajan was very much a soldier emperor and under his leadership, the Roman Empire grew to its largest extent. In the latter half of his reign, he came into increasing conflict with the Parthian Empire as he expanded the borders of Rome eastwards into Armenia, Babylon and other parts of ancient Mesopotamia. But at the start of his reign, Trajan's attentions were focused on a very different frontier around the river Danube, where Rome's empire bordered with the kingdom of Dacia. The Dacian king Decebalus had already come into conflict with one of Trajan's predecessors, the emperor Domitian. In fact, he'd extracted a very advantageous peace treaty from Domitian, which made Domitian's claims about having achieved a great victory and his celebration of a triumph seem rather hollow. Trajan knew that he needed to deal with Decebalus once and for all if he was to secure Roman control in that region. So in 101 AD, he launched the first of his Dacian campaigns and succeeded in defeating Decebalus, who was forced to give up some of his territories, but allowed to keep his throne. Of course, it wasn't long before Decebalus seized the opportunity to fight back. And in 105, he himself invaded Roman territory in turn, starting the Second Dacian War. Trajan's forces prevailed and Decebalus committed suicide and there's a rather gruesome story that his head was taken back to Rome to be thrown down some ceremonial stairs which were traditionally a site of execution and a place connected with dishonour in death. Trajan decided to commemorate his victory in the Dacian Wars with some monumental building, partly because Decebalus had been harassing Rome's Danubian frontier for some time, but also because Trajan really wanted to set himself apart from the Emperor Domitian, as the Emperor who really did defeat Decebalus, not the Emperor who merely pretended to. And what better way to get that message across than to design a large monumental space, a forum funded by the spoils of war, with porticos, a market area, a temple, a triumphal arch, a pair of libraries, and in between them a huge carved column depicting the events of the Dacian Wars. So today we are really looking forward to discussing Trajan's column with John. We want to ask John about the sculpting process. A Trajan's column features a helical frieze that winds all the way up and depicts key events from both Dacian wars. So we definitely want to hear more about how this frieze, how this monument came into being, uh, how much of it was planned, how much of it was unplanned, who made the decisions of what to include and how. But we also want to ask about the relationship between the representation of the Dacian Wars on the column and historical reality. To what extent can we read the column as a historical document? And does the column represent broader ideas about warfare and imperialism, about models of generalship, military discipline, and the virtues that the Romans thought underpinned good strategic decision making? Trajan's column is worth studying closely, not just to help us understand how war and victory were depicted in the Roman Empire, but also to get us thinking about the very complex relationship between the stories we tell and the ways that we do war. John, hello, and welcome to the Visualizing War podcast. Hello, Nicholas. Hello, Alice. Thanks for inviting me along. Thanks for coming. John, it would be great if you could give our listeners a quick introduction to Trajan's column. Okay, Trajan's Column is uh, right in the centre of Rome. It's the climax of one of the largest, if not the largest, complexes of public buildings that were constructed by the Roman emperors. It was dedicated in 113 AD, and it goes along with a great piazza, colonnades, a huge basilica, a pair of libraries, statuary inscriptions, and all sorts of imagery in, in addition to the column itself. And the column stands in a little 
courtyard, colonnaded courtyard, and it is 34 metres high. It has a 200 metre long uh, helical frieze carved at about half life size up the outside of the column shaft. So the column shaft is an artificial unit. It's 100 Roman feet high. It sits on a pedestal. Uh, it has internal staircase, spiral staircase, and that takes you up to a balcony. And that gives you views over Rome. And it comes at a time when the Roman Empire is at its greatest extent. It's at its strongest. Uh, the maps that you get in atlases of the, of the ancient world always show the Roman Empire under Trajan because uh, it gets down to the Persian Gulf and well across the Danube and, and, and elsewhere. So in a sense, um, Trajan's Column is a gift to us because it survives intact, whilst all those other buildings around it have been destroyed by earthquakes or despoliated for their marble and metalwork and things. So it's a miracle the thing survives. And John, I think you've been researching this column for, for a very long time, and I should just point out to listeners that John has a Trajan's Column project website, which you can get to by going to the School of Classics website at the University of St Andrews. And there are images and images on there. And we've also got a short blog post on the Visualising Wall website, which is going to capture a few images about scenes which John is particularly going to be talking about today. You were mentioning that this this column was originally part of a larger architectural uh, setup um, that also included libraries. So, I mean, at first sight, that is maybe uh, surprising to see a, a war monument, a monument celebrating a military success in a setup that also includes libraries. Do you know why there were libraries as part of this, uh, this, this setup? Was this just a convention or was there kind of a deeper link between the column and, uh, and its surroundings? So much of ancient literature is concerned with war and the historical effects of war uh, that I, I, I see no... I see no contradiction between, you know, peacefully sitting in a library uh, and reading about violence and, and destruction <laughs> from that point of view. And so much of our surviving literature is, is you know, tactical manuals and other more technical um, texts. What the second answer to your question is, is the, the trap of this is that we know that Trajan wrote his own commentary, his commentaries on his Dacian Wars. Now Trajan's column has this 200 meter long frieze but with more than 2,600 human figures on it and scenery and ships and landscape and barbarians and everything else, and pack animals, that is purporting to represent a narrative of the wars. And people always wanted to use this as a substitute for the lost text, because here we have Rome's greatest emperor, the empire at its greatest extent, uh, a legend in his own lifetime in terms of the, the titles that were showered on him by the Senate. Yet we don't actually have surviving a complete written narrative of the Trajanic period. We have fragments of historians like Dio, uh, but we don't have a biography of Trajan and we don't have, you know, a joined up historical texts. Uh, so people have been sucked into using this immensely detailed freeze as a historical document. And much of my work has actually been showing that this is a, a bit of a fantasy and that there are many other forces at work apart from narration of events. Just following up on this, but could you expand a little bit on this? Because I was quite interested in, in that as well. So uh, obviously what has come out of what you were just saying is that the, the, the column was originally not supposed to be looked at just on its own. It was part of a, say, kind of a network of different uh, of different narratives, which is obviously uh, something that's quite interesting um, to our project. But you were also saying uh, that that adds to the complexity of, of the column and leads to, I think you were saying it, the trap to think that uh, we can just look at one element of what was originally a complex dialogue and just think we can get all parts of the original narrative out of this. Could you say a bit more about the of the pitfalls of this approach? Well, it's a, it's a very winsome approach. You can see why people want to do this. Um, people have looked at the, this helical freeze and, and made connections with cine films and uh, cartoon strips, and um, they've emphasised a lot of the continuous element of the narrative. It is actually dividable down into scenes, 
and these are divided off by trees or by uh, the direction of figures, you know, groups of figures standing back to back, this sort of thing. There are ways of discerning different subjects and different joints. Uh, so uh, it's made up of uh, a lot of generic scenes, if you like, um, which are not historically specific. The meta history, if you like, the you know, emperors did address speeches to soldiers, soldiers did build camps and march in columns and things. So that's what you would do, but uh, uh, when you're trying to represent this pictorially. Uh, and so what this is rather less like a, uh, like a, a cartoon strip or, or a, a film, it's much more like beads on a string. Uh, and the colours of the beads, if you like, are colour coded by the genres of scenes are being represented. So the speech, the ad locutio is one of them, building scenes, sacrifice scenes. Um, and they're all, they all happened during wars, but they're presented formulaically in, in set order. Um, so that starts to be artificial. They're on a 100 Roman foot tall space. So that's artificial. Uh, and there are other ways of looking at it that that cut across any sort of helix. We can we can talk about that a bit more if you like. Uh, but there are vertical axes up the shaft uh, where you're actually not intended to walk around this thing twenty plus times, keeping your eye on the events. It would be impossible. You'd, you'd get giddy and fall over and stuff. That's really fascinating. I will ask you a bit more about those sculptors in a minute, but just picking up on a couple of the points you've been making there. I like that analogy of the string of beads, this idea that the, the scenes in the column are a, a set of almost stock images of war, sort of tropes, uh, traditional representations, the kinds of things you might expect in a war narrative and not necessarily a kind of chronologically accurate or linear story that whirls up the column. You then reach the top and you reach Trajan at the top. So there is presumably some kind of chronology in the scenes, is that right? Or is there no chronology at all? Is it a set of, uh, you know, a, a, a variety of the kinds of scenes that you might get in any war, not specifically the Dacian Wars? It's partly the latter, un unspecific of any Roman war, uh, but the sculptors did have, I think, the uh, the commission to show Roman soldiers in contemporary equipment and barbarians as identifiably uh, belonging to ethnic types. In other words, the Dacians, who are the main enemies of these wars, which are on the uh, Middle and Lower Danube region, sort of Romania, effectively, in, in modern day terms. Um, there is a progression through time, because you do start at the beginning uh, and weave your way up to uh, the denouement of the wars. I should say there are two wars. We know this from other sources, 101 to 2, 105 to 6 AD, and they're divided on, on the shaft mathematically halfway up by a winged victory flanked by, by trophies. And she is writing on a shield that stands on a pedestal. And we know from the coins that she's um, writing Victoria Dacica, um, she's writing to commemorate this victory. So being halfway up, that is in itself an artificial constraint on the content, right? Um, and it looks, if you analyze the content, it looks as though hugely more happens in the first war uh, than happens in the second war. Um, and that means that um, because they're not working from cartoons, I think they, they might be working from a model a small model marked up with the victory on it. And there are some historical scenes. Don't get me wrong, it's not ahistorical. So one of the points of this war is to, sh of this whole narrative, is to show the war is decisive. And the, de the decision comes with the death of the barbarian king, Decabalus. He commits suicide as he's surprised by Roman soldiers. His head is displayed to the army. And again, from epigraphic sources, we know the exact day when it arrived in Rome and was thrown down a monumental staircase uh, from the Capitol down into the Forum. So we've got odd little sort of links with the real chronology, if you see what I mean, uh, with what they're representing on the column. So if you add that to the, the, the formulaic scenes, what you've got is one color of bead on this, this string wrapped around the shaft is the historical scenes that are important to incorporate 
into a sort of more specific narrative. And what that means is that they tend to bunch up some of these more generic scenes or because they're not working from a cartoon, because they haven't measured this out beforehand, sometimes they've got too much space and they have to fill up and string out scenes. And other times they, they squash them up in a really narrow space. So a whole marching column might actually be going diagonally up a scene because there's just no room uh, for all the people they want to get in. So this all sounds very accidental and all very, very rather incompetent, doesn't it, in some respects? Uh, but it's, it's leaving a tremendous uh, series of clues on how the project was planned, how it was executed, uh, and very much what was going on in the minds of these planners and sculptors, um, who I think were probably the same people anyway, uh, who were involved in this. And lastly, there is the most extraordinary fact of this, and that is to divide up the band, you have a convention for, for ground, for rock, if you like, which is a little ribbon that runs below all the scenes. Now, you'd think you've got a hundred foot column, all you need to do is wrap a rope around it, paint a diagonal line or helical line, and that gives you your divider, and you can work within the fields between those painted lines to fill in your scenes. Straightforward. No, they never did that. So they never actually measured the shaft up properly when they'd started sculpting. So not only are they bunching stuff up and stringing it out, through the course of the project, they are compensating and sometimes overcompensating and then sometimes panicking when they think they have not enough room left up the shaft or too much room left up the shaft. Because towards the end, they're thinking, we've got much less to show, we've still got all this space, what are we going to do? Uh, and therefore, this is a dynamic process. I think that's, that's the important takeaway from this. It's dynamic, and the executive decisions are being made at the stone face, not by some maestro, some great artist uh, who's micromanaging this. It is the sculptors themselves who are doing this sort of uh, work. So, John, one question I have immediately after what you were just saying is that apparently for us, uh, as we are looking at Trajan's column, it looks like a unified narrative, well organized and everything. But once you start digging deeper, you actually see that there were lots of different people working on this and the, the production process itself, the dynamics, the spontaneity of the production had a huge influence on how they were representing parts of this. So the big question for us here is, is obviously a Trajan commissioned the column, but uh, whose vision of war uh, do we actually see depicted on it? Well, here, here, I suppose you're touching on, on the question of agency. I, th I think um, commentators of Roman art have been very lazy about this in the past and, and not asked the right questions. Uh, with coinage, for example, the way people usually present it in, in their prose is that you know Trajan issued such and such a coin motif or, or, or design, and there's the sort of implied interest of the emperor directly in this you know he gets up in the morning and a series of drawings are put in front of him and he goes let's go oh, i'll have that one i think that looks nice or or he he sends a message to the mint said right i want some coins with victory doing this and doing that and whatever and it may be that some emperors were <laughs> very keen on their image uh, and a lot of others of course the, the system grinds on as it were in 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 a fashion that is considered to be acceptable to the emperor and in the in the in the flavor of if you like you know so mm -hmm. you're not actually looking into trajan's mind necessarily uh, and his own views on things uh, i think that's an important element uh, another important element is that one should say that from the epigraphic evidence trajan's column was actually dedicated uh, presumably commissioned tendered Uh, paid for by the Senate, not by the Emperor. Whereas the rest of the complex was Trajan's, you know, ben beneficence to the city of Rome. Uh, so the Emperor uh, is a step back from it anyway, in formal terms. Um, and sure, senators will have a quiet word or, you know, <laughs> um, uh, we'll find out what, what the Emperor wants and, and they're not going to put 
they're not going to say, right, let's have a really good scene of the Roman army being slaughtered en masse uh, because Trajan messed up at that on that particular day. You know, there's clearly there's <laughs> life preserving ways of doing this. But I think, you know, a senatorial commission would work out the finances, work out who to get the contracts to in terms of the sculptor's workshops, engage the architects, because it's, of course, sculpture on a, a, an amazingly designed uh, architectural piece in its own right. If it had not a drop of scul sculpture on it, uh, it would still be an engineering project of, of great distinction. So there's a lot of practicality there. But I think when it comes actually down to the representation of the two wars and the victory, what you've got is um, intelligent, uh, uh, infinitely skilled sculptors uh, who are at the, pun intended, at the cutting edge of representing um, victorious art and victorious achievement within a world where as there is throughout Roman society a lot of shared uh, models of generalship, virtues of, of, of leadership, uh, good decision making and where to and pietas to the gods and all the other things. Um, but Trajan himself, of course, would have would have highlighted or at least alluded to in a subtle way in his commentarii, just as Caesar does in his commentarii. You know, there's a way of representing uh, yourself as the main actor, which Caesar does extraordinarily skillfully, and Trajan sure will have read Caesar and, and the, the other commentarii that don't survive for us, uh, but which were kicking around by the late uh, first century AD. So there's a literature out there. The coins themselves also feed into this because they have generic types, uh, exactly the same sort of victory in terms of pose and everything else uh, as, as, as is on the column, appears on the coins. Uh, Ad locutio scenes, you know, emperor and military audience, the depiction of standards, military standards, barbarian equipment, all the rest of it. These are things that are happening in other media. But I think what's different here is that there is a specific directive, and it may be from Trajan himself or from the commissioners or whoever, that contemporary details should be used. Real Dacian barbarians from their clothes and equipment, real Roman soldiers uh, in their equipment of the Trajanic period, who are, after all, visible and in the streets of Rome by the thousands by the time of Trajan. The permanent Roman military presence in Rome is immense. I think what you're saying is really fascinating, John, because we're so used to looking at this column as this very ancient ruin. And what, what you're reminding us with this emphasis on really contemporary details, Romans as they see themselves in the street depicted on the column, um, Dacians as they actually might have been met in battle very recently, uh, helps us just realise what a modern monument it must have looked like to the people of Rome walking past it. And, and what a startling, you know, obviously an engineering feat, um, but startling in terms of some of the details of its representation too. Yes. Um, I, I should, one element I haven't mentioned is that the pedestal, that the column shaft stands on um, is carved with originally probably something like 600 items of barbarian military equipment or larger than life size. Uh, so, you know, square meters of shields and swords and standards and pieces of armor and, you know, in the most, because it's such a large scale and it's in your face, it's where you're standing before you go in through the door as it were. Um, these are, are in exquisite detail. And I think they also uh, give us a, a sort of window into what's going on here, uh, because on one level, they are clearly Dacian. They're clearly trans-Danubian types of swords and uh, stand, um, snare, uh, wolf headed standards and, and the things that we know from other sources are genuine. But they're also intricately decorated and the decoration is all what you would expect. Uh, what we've got here is, yes, real stuff picked off the battlefield, taken to Rome, displayed in Trajan's triumphs, 
perhaps lodged in on display in temples and other public buildings, uh, and then eventually used as models uh, for the different classes of equipment to be carved on the column, right? At that point, painters, the artists in Rome, are adding details that they think of as representing victory and triumph onto genuine bits of barbarian equipment. So it may be that you've got a number of, if you like, overlays of things going on here, uh, so that by the time the sculptors are using them as models, you have a pastiche of uh, um, what the closest thing I can think of is, is Hollywood costume design in, in Sword and Sandals movies. Um, there are elements of the real thing in there, but it's also designed by costume people, armorers, etc., pandering to what they think the cinema going audience wants to see and will understand and will expect, not actually the realia of the situation. That's extremely interesting, John. And one of the questions that uh, comes out of this for me is, uh, so if in what way would you say uh, could Trajan's column help us understand Roman habits of visualizing war at a sort of more general level? I think Trajan's column is doing a number of things. It's, it's addressing messages to an audience, a metropolitan audience in Rome, which is quite a, it is a sophisticated one. It's seen men of triumphs, it's seen lots of triumphal art, it's seen lots of barbarians in the streets, uh, in the entourages of wealthy senatorial class Romans, etc. Um, it's seen barbarians in the amphitheatres, uh, and there are plenty of notices that, that suggest that Germans and Dacians and Sarmatians and North Africans and Syrians and others are bimbling around Rome in their ethnic dress, uh, hairstyles, etc. So it's an, it's an audience which is familiar with the world beyond the city, very much so. I suppose in a way that, that the theatre-going public uh, in Victorian London would have been familiar with you know, Queen Victoria's enemies, if you like, and a stock series of ethnotypes, uh, Zulus, Afghans, uh, Sudanese, etc., defined in exactly the same way by clothing, hairstyle and weapon types. So there's a, a, a sophisticated expectation. There's the actual events themselves, which do trickle through into the sculptors. I'm not denying that by any means. Uh, and that is part of the job. Part of the job is to depict wars, which by capturing the barbarian king's treasure, by the way, that is ploughed directly into paying for the forum complex. So representing the treasure on the column and, uh, and in, in inscriptions, ex manubiis inscriptions, uh, around, monumental inscriptions around the complex, makes that message. You know, we've got successful war, we've got the, the booty from war, we've got the glory, we've got the virtues of the emperor being exercised, the disciplina of the forces under his control specifically, or perhaps precisely because they were almost indistinguishable, that such a fuss is made of Trajan. Uh, and the bottom line is that Domitian failed to bring down the barbarian Decabalus. Trajan makes everybody fully aware down to the tossing of the severed head down the, uh, the, the wailing steps uh, the Scalae Gemoniae, um, as a public ceremony, if you like. So I think all this uh, comes together in the column, and it's screaming at the viewing public, this is genuine, this is true, this is real, this is regime change, you yeah? know, like Gulf War I to Gulf War II. That's some really interesting context there, John. So it, it's just really fascinating to hear a little bit more about how the column represents both a sort of a historical, a very contemporary set of issues as well as contemporary events. But also you mentioned earlier the way in which its imagery, its representation of war also draws on shared ideas, uh, shared models of good generalship that come from all sorts of texts as well as other art that's surrounding people in the city of Rome, coins you mentioned, this wider discourse of war feeds into the column, but yet the column somehow still manages to capture a very specific event and respond to and communicate about a very specific political context. Can you just reflect very briefly before we move on um, about how you think this column, how how this column's representation of war compares perhaps with more modern habits of commemorating or indeed imagining specific wars? 
Yes, I think the 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 column is in some respects a very Roman monument in that Roman ideal victory and ideal uh, behaviour in war follows particular virtues. So its presentation of the of the emperor's actions are very much in that light. It's also a, a pan Mediterranean culture uh, which um, celebrates its own technological achievements in terms of artillery and the complex business of besieging cities and organizing large people numbers of people on the landscape uh, in, which in pre-industrial societies is not easy the discipline of the armies is, is a double-edged thing in that it's it's about constant camping constant building of fortifications overnight enclosures etc uh, which from Polybius onwards um, is something that impresses everybody about the Romans. Uh, they do this as part of their military culture. Uh, and yes, there are practical reasons for this, but it's also part of a culture. Uh, it's what Roman soldiers do. Uh, so the real prominence of constructing camps and forts on the column, everybody uh, has, has commented on at some stage. Um, you know, modern generals have looked at this in the 19th century and gone, you know, as soon as casts were available uh, and, and fully drawn up editions were published, uh, people could dip into this and think about military virtues in their own world. Uh, so Louis XIV, you know, bridging the Rhine was immediately compared to uh, Trajan uh, bridging the Danube for two reasons. One, this whole business of, of Louis XIV as uh, Le Trajan de, de France, you know, the, the French Trajan. Uh, but also Louis XIV was the first person to, have to commission a complete set of casts of the monument uh, so that people for the first time could see the whole thing in the flesh once removed, if you like. So the reception of this go goes in waves rather interestingly, uh, and people do buy into this. Uh, for example, during the American Civil War, um, the Confederate uh, forces early on in the war were very resistant for all sorts of um, cultural and racist reasons to digging field works themselves. This was not seen to be proper work for soldiers. Um, and people like Robert E. Lee were basically saying, well, this is what the Romans did. And the Romans carved a great empire, so get on with it. <laughs> you know? um, uh, so um, Trajan's Commons had a if you like, pun intended again, has cast a tremendous shadow across military history thereafter, like some texts that have survived all the way through, like Vegetius, for example. People take these things on campaign with them. Well, I'm not saying anybody took, took casts of Trajan's Column on campaign, uh, but it's there in the background to inspire. So it is very specific to the Roman concepts of, um, of proper victory. There are no serious last stands you know there's no um victory plucked from the jaws of defeat type scenarios because that's stupid don't get yourself into that situation in the first place it's not to say that roman armies didn't get defeated or that crises under trajan didn't happen uh, surely they did uh, but it's not what you present uh, as being ideal um the, the ideal virtues of generalship and warfare for listeners who want to dive a bit deeper, John Coulston has created a website about Trajan's Column, which you can find by searching the St Andrew's Classics website. And as we mentioned during the interview, there's also a blog on the Visualising War website with some images of the column illustrating some of the things that John talked about in this interview. We hope that you've enjoyed hearing all about Trajan's Column and what it can tell us about ancient and modern habits of imagining victory and representing war. We're going to be talking about past habits of visualising war in future podcast episodes, but our next episode is going to be firmly focused on the 21st century. We'll be looking at war art again, but a very different kind of war art from Trajan's column. Our guest will be Iraqi artist Rana Ibrahim, who will discuss her personal experiences of conflict and the ways that she uses art today to help other women tell their war stories, both their memories of happier times, but also the loss and suffering that war has caused them. Do tune in. Rana's representation of what she calls ordinary things is a really fascinating counterpoint to what we've been talking about today. 
instead of a Greek victory monument set up by a powerful all conquering emperor, her art really amplifies the voices of ordinary women and captures how war has impacted them. If you have enjoyed today's episode, please tell others about it and do subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or whatever platform you use so you don't miss an episode. And please do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts that really helps people find the show. If you would like to join the conversation further, you can follow us on social media, just search for Visualizing War or get in touch directly by emailing us at viswar at saintandrews.ac.uk. Our theme music was composed by Jonathan Young and the show was mixed by Sophia Gertin. Thank you for listening.